question is, what can I do if I can't get a doctor's note due to the cost? So I'm afraid you would have, if it's a medical condition, you have to have medical evidence, but there are possibilities. So if you've had counselling, for example, then we would accept um, a note from counselling. If you've been to student support and you've had an appointment, um, even if it's just a triage, then we would accept that as well. Okay. But if medical evidence, you have to have some kind of medical evidence, unless you can self-certify. Okay. And self-certification, how does that work? So self-certification is a new thing that came in this year. And what this allows you to do is to, it's a similar thing staff can do. So it allows you to say, I've got, for example, you might have a cold or something like that. I've got a cold. You don't have to produce any evidence. And you say to the university, there's a form you fill in. I am self-certifying because of whatever it is. And this is going to affect a particular assessment or an exam. But you can only do it before the assessment or before the deadline. Okay. So you can't sit in the middle of an exam and go, oh, I'm going to self-certify now. It doesn't work like that. Okay. You can have two periods of seven days in a year and they have to be separated by up to 14 days. If I wake up on the day of the exam, not able to attend, and can we do it for both like OSCE sort of exams but also similar exams? Okay, so if it was actually, if it's before the assessment, you would be able to self-certify, as far as I know, but the best thing to do is to fill in, you need to immediately contact the school, fill in an extenuating circumstances form or self-certification form and say why you can't come. For the exams, you need to contact the school and tell us, um, explaining why. With exams, um, if it's going to be a longer term thing, or, or for the OSCE actually, then you would need to go to a GP and get a note to explain why you'd missed mm -hmm. it. Okay. So, in terms of OSCEs, how fit do you actually have to be to sit? <laughs> so, fit to sit is um, or something about your is it regards your professional competency so if you were working as a pharmacist you would have to make a decision about whether you were well enough to go into work so that's really what fit to sit is about it's teaching you that professional responsibility and it applies to a number of different exams but the one that will test the one that everyone knows about is the OSCE so if you sign the register and it's very clearly written at the top of it you are declaring yourself fit to sit so at that point, you cannot then submit extenuating circumstances saying to us, oh, I was feeling really anxious or I've been feeling ill for days, but I still went and did it anyway, because we will simply say you signed the register, mm -hmm. you knew what you were signing for. Obviously, if you actually collapse in the middle of the OSCE, and we do have people who are ill, then you are allowed to put in extenuating mm -hmm. circumstances. And in fact, the evidence will come from the invigilators, the examiner, the actor. We can all provide evidence that if you look, because I have actually had people collapse in the session. It does happen occasionally so you we do take that into account but if you sign then you are declaring yourself fit to sit and as far as we're concerned that's um that holds um, so what can i do if i have anxiety during exams and i think it's impeding my performance okay so there's two kinds of anxiety there's the normal sort we all get when you're going to sit an exam a test do something you haven't done before that is not covered by extenuating circumstances. But there is also the kind of anxiety which is really debilitating, which actually affects your ability to do things, might affect your ability to revise, might mean that you're capable of revising, but you get to the exam and you simply can't remember anything. Mm -hmm. If you suffer from that type of anxiety, then you can submit extenuating circumstances in advance. We accept that in advance if you say, I have anxiety, and you would need to provide some evidence. So that evidence would probably have to be from a GP, but it could again be from a counsellor, student support, you're somebody who knows you potentially if not, none of those things are available, although really it needs to be some kind of medical evidence. And what we would then do is we would accept that that anxiety is sufficiently debilitating and will affect your performance and we will take that into account. Okay. So I'm currently doing a group coursework and I think I've got a personal situation that would fit extenuating circumstances. How would me submitting extenuating circumstances affect the group? Okay, so you can uh, submit extenuating circumstances for any kind of assessment. It doesn't matter whether it's an individual one, an exam, group, coursework. You submit, you explain, you provide evidence. And what we then do is, for example, if there's a peer assessment associated with that assessment, what we might do is not use the peer assessment for you. So we might not moderate your mark with it. It would depend on how the assessment works. Um, as far as we're concerned, as long as you've turned up and done it, with the rest of your group, um, your rest of your group wouldn't be affected by extenuating circumstances and that their marks wouldn't change, but your mark might if we didn't use the peer um, 
assessment mm -hmm. side of it. And also what would happen then is that result would have an A code, your mark would have an A code next to it, which means extenuating circumstances have been accepted for that particular assessment. And if there was nothing else we could do to mitigate the effect, then the module would carry a PX code. And what if, assuming you pass it, and what that means mm -hmm. is it's eligible for the discounting eventually okay. for your final degree. Um, I don't feel comfortable talking to my tutor. Who else can I talk to about extenuating circumstances? Okay, so we encourage people to go and see their tutor in the first instance because usually you would have some relationship with your tutor and you would know them. However, if you don't want to talk to your tutor, then you can talk to me. Um, you can talk to Alex White, the programme director. You could talk to Alan Coslett, the senior personal tutor. We're probably the three best people to talk to. And we can then provide you with some advice and we can, if necessary, send you elsewhere if we think you need other help. You can, of course, go and talk to any member of staff. If there's somebody you know particularly, you can go and talk to them mm -hmm. as well. So that okay. is another option. I feel like I need some help. I don't want to have to wait a long time in a, a line or a queue. So what can I do now? So what you can do now is you can go to student support. They have drop-in sessions which run in the morning and the afternoon between I think it's at night 10 and 12 and 2 and 4 p.m. And if you turn up, they will somebody will see you, if it's urgent, somebody will see you immediately for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then what they will do is they'll fill in a form. That form can then be used for extenuating circumstances. We will accept that because it's filled in by somebody who's trained. And then they will make appointments or they will give you advice to go to a GP, go to a hospital, or they will make an appointment for you to come back and see somebody. So there is help available. And obviously, if something is really wrong, you can always go straight to hospital, to a &E. mm -hmm. In current times with the coronavirus, what can I do if I'm an EU student and I'm planning on heading home at Easter, but I'm worried about airport closures and the fact I might not be able to get back for our skis? Okay, so in that case, what you need to do is, obviously the situation is changing all the time, so you would need to take a decision a day or so before your flight, you need to look at the advice in the UK, because that will tell you about returning, and also you need to look at the advice in your own country and see what is being said. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment there are obviously certain countries such as Italy, which are very difficult to get in and out of. There are, most of the rest of Europe is okay, but the situation could change in a month. Mm -hmm. And you need to think very carefully, weigh up the risks and the benefits of going home and then not being able to get back for your assessments. Mm -hmm. um, make a decision as to whether you think in the long run it's actually worth going okay. because you might not return. But that yeah. has to be a decision that you make. Okay. If you go and you then can't get back, you would be able to submit extenuating circumstances if you could prove that, for example, all the flights from your country okay. had been grounded. Right, okay. Yeah. What can I do if I can't get evidence immediately? So what you do is you submit the extenuating circumstances form and you say that evidence is pending and then you get the evidence and you submit it. And what we will do is when we have our regular meetings, we'll discuss it, we'll note if there's no evidence and then what we will write to you is say, your extenuating circumstances claim has been accepted, pending evidence. Okay. And as long as by the Board of Examiners, which is actually the final date in June, mm -hmm. we have that evidence, we will accept it. If okay. the evidence doesn't come in and we will chase you for it as we get nearer to the time, no evidence, I'm afraid we don't accept the claim. Okay, so I can submit it in Christmas time, but it actually has to be in by June. Yes, but we, okay. it's better that the more timely the evidence is. The evidence yeah. needs to be... So, for example, if you go to the GP, we will be looking for a date on the letter that is related, okay, close to the yeah. time. If you're talking about somebody's death, we would expect to see um, a death certificate that is relatively close in time, okay. not somebody who died a year ago, okay. for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be timely. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to get a death certificate. What can I do? Okay, so if somebody dies, we would, the university usually requires us to for you, to ask you to obtain a death certificate. And this is possible if it's a close relative because you will know the family and you'll be able to do this. If it's a friend, this can be much more difficult because it's very difficult to ask somebody's parents mm. for a death certificate. In that case, we will accept the order of service, but we would need a copy of the front page so that we can see the name, the date, so that we can see that it relates directly to your claim. Okay. We will also accept them for people who might be, say, say a relative, a more distant relative, a godparent, somebody you're very close to, mm -hmm. but they're not a direct family member. We yeah. will accept extenuating circumstances for okay. that. And again, we would accept an order of service. Um, I don't want anyone to know about my extenuating circumstances. What can I do? 
Okay, so confidentiality is really important. As it is, we everything is confidential. There are only about five people who ever see the extenuating circumstances. We have an area on the shared drive which has restricted access. And in the Board of Examiners, we would simply say that the extenuating circumstances have been accepted and we would never disclose the nature mm -hmm. of those circumstances. So everything is confidential to a limited number of people. If you have something where you really, really don't want anyone to know, you want as few as people as possible, and we have had the odd example in the past, for example, where people have terminated an unwanted pregnancy, then what we do is we have a confidential route where you hand the extenuating circumstances in an envelope to a member of staff, it's often Alan Coslett. He will look at them and he will show them to one other member of the extenuating circumstances group so that there are two people who can validate it. And then they will simply say to the rest of the group, so-and-so has extenuating circumstances which are confidential, they do not wish them to be disclosed. We have looked at them, the evidence, there is evidence and we are accepting them. Okay. And at that and at that point, and then they are um, they're kept in a locked drawer so that and they're not put anywhere where anybody else can see them and the contents are never disclosed. Um, so I think my personal situation, it might be quite hard to find evidence, so what can I do? Okay, so we do have this. So one example is where parents are divorcing and this is obviously affecting the, the student because they may be going to have to move house, there may be a very unpleasant atmosphere at home. If there's no, we can obviously accept legal evidence that the divorce might not have reached that point or there may be problems with one parent blocking mm -hmm. having access to things. In that case, what we would accept is a letter from one of the parents, for example, explaining what is happening and explaining the impact on you. And we have accepted those kind of letters in the past. Okay. Um, so I'm worried that me putting forward an extenuating circumstances form might stop me from being able to become a form pharmacist. So I think you're talking about fitness to practice. Yes. Okay, so fitness to practice is there very, a large part of it is there to support people if they have various, if the various things happen in their lives. As far as mental health is concerned, which is often a major issue, we wouldn't put somebody through fitness to practice if you've got a mental health condition that's been diagnosed, you're doing something about it, you're going to have drugs, counselling, support. Basically, it's something where you're going to live with the condition, but it's not going to impede you doing things. Then fitness to practice wouldn't come into it. And there are lots of people, there will be pharmacists with depression and anxiety, but as long as it's managed and it doesn't impede, impede their ability to be a pharmacist, then it isn't a problem. So please don't think that if you come forward, we will automatically initiate fitness to practice mm -hmm. against you, because we won't. Okay. Any support or signposting available after I've submitted an extenuating circumstances form? Okay, so the school can provide support through your personal tutor, through the staff I mentioned earlier. But what we would advise you to do is to go to your GP, go to student support. Student support, very good. Um, they can provide counselling, they can provide advice, they've got a lot of self-help. So that is what we would normally suggest. Uh, obviously staff can, advise, can help, but we would normally signpost and send you to student support or your GP. Okay. What is the latest I can submit extenuating circumstances for summer exams? So we will send you a letter, an email, normally we send it out in April, which will explain about extenuating circumstances, give you the link, and it will provide a date by which you must submit them. Mm -hmm. And that date is, we, we know, we usually when we send the letter, we know when all the exams will have taken place. Mm -hmm. And that date will always be after the, all the exams have taken place and before our board of examiners. Mm -hmm. And you must submit by that date. Okay. If you do not submit by that date, you submit the week after we will we are not allowed by the university to accept the circumstances mm -hmm. you might not have evidence and that's the but we we would encourage you to get the evidence to as quickly as possible but the evidence has to turn up by the morning of the board of examiners if we don't have it when we go into the board of examiners we cannot accept your circumstances